Hi, and welcome to the five minute check in. Well, today we might go over the five minutes because we have a very special subject. We're going to be talking about both bird flu and measles. And we have a special guest with us today, Dr. Hannah Sali, who is a professor of molecular biology and microbiology at the Vaccine and Treatment Evaluation Unit at the Baylor College of Medicine. Hannah, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. All right, let's get right to it. A lot of news around bird flu. And then right after we hear the word bird flu, we hear the words H5N1. So I thought maybe we could just start with explaining what is all of this? Is this a form of influenza? What does the H5N1 mean? And then maybe we'll get into a little bit about what are the potential clinical implications for this? Of course. So uh, bird flu or H5N1 is a type of uh, flu A. You know, flu comes in flu A and flu B, the two most common uh, ones infecting humans. Mm -hmm. The H5N1 is part of flu A. Each influenza virus has two projections of proteins on its surface, the H and the N, and these come in different subtypes as well. Mm -hmm. So this is H5N1. One, Got you it. know these types of proteins. So those are two different proteins that sit on influenza A. So mm -hmm. and also called bird flu. So yes. one of the reasons this came up, at least for me, other than just being in the press, was the New England Journal just published uh, a survey or of results uh, what's happening in the United States. Um, what tell us a little bit about that publication? I know it came out in December originally online, but just came out on paper recently. What what did that highlight for us? Course. So this particular publication describes the clinical manifestations in 46 humans infected with the H5N1 bird flu. So far in the United States, there are 70 uh, individuals infected with the virus, as far as we know. And this particular description is of those initial 46. Mm -hmm. um, of those 46, they were uh, mainly exposed to dairy cattle or to poultry with one person having an unknown exposure. So almost all were exposed in the setting of poultry or uh, dairy cattle. And of those uh, 46 individuals, uh, all had mild disease. The main manifestation uh, was a conjunctivitis, meaning irritation and redness in the eye mm -hmm. without visual disturbances, just irritation in the eye. And that, was, that occurred in more than 90% of those individuals. And uh, they also had a few other symptoms, uh, mainly cough, feverishness, fatigue, myalgia, the other uh, symptoms that go with. So nothing, nothing dramatic, nothing life-threatening. Nothing life-threatening. However, outside of those 46 individuals and in the big pool of 70 people having had the virus so far in the States in the current outbreak, we know of one person who had severe disease. Mm. And that person unfortunately died as a result mm. of this. So I guess that leads to the question is, you know, should we be worried, um, you know, about this new virus as it moves from animal to human? Um, and how, how do you think about this? Uh, at the moment, the risk of this virus becoming transmissible, meaning going from human to human easily, remains low. However, that is in the general community. And individuals who work on dairy farms, who work in poultry farms, who have backyard flocks, uh, that is a different dynamic, meaning they are at higher risk of acquiring this infection. Having said that, there are ways to prevent this from happening. Uh, and that is what we call, uh, using what we call the uh, personal protect protective equipment. And that includes masks, uh, eye protection, and if available, uh, respirators, if there are no masks. So it sounds like in general, this is not something, but it, it sounds like you're, you know, from your, your specialty and your world, this is, you're, you're doing surveillance of all of this. Yes. So there are different ways of preparing uh, to detect should this outbreak become more widespread and what to do in that should it become more widespread? Mm -hmm. So at the moment, uh, whether in the US or elsewhere, there's intense surveillance on farms and in the community looking for 
any signs that this virus is becoming more transmissible. There are different labs looking at certain uh, changes in the virus itself that might make it more transmissible. On the prevention end, uh, there are vaccines that have been tested previously uh, that are uh, predicted to have activity against the virus mm -hmm. should the virus become uh, more transmissible. And those particular vaccines right now are being stockpiled in the strategic national stockpile of the United States. Great. So it sounds like we should not necessarily be that worried. We have folks that might be working in the poultry business that we may keep an eye on that. But it's good to know that folks like you are doing the surveillance to see if this ever mutates and becomes more transmittable between, you know, person to person. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, let's pivot and go to something not completely different, but a little different, which is what's happening right outside of where you are, the measles outbreak that everyone's been reading about. You know, do a little comparison here for H5N1 versus measles and, and, and what's happening with this measles outbreak as of today. Yeah. In its current uh, form, the H5N1 is not uh, easily transmissible between humans. There is no sustained human-to-human -human transmission. That is in stark difference to measles. Measles is probably the most contagious uh, virus uh, that, we, that we know of. Out of each person infected with measles in the right setting can infect an average of 18 uh, other persons. So uh, right now, we are in the midst of an outbreak. Uh, so far nationwide, there are 222 cases of measles that have been confirmed. Um, the majority are in Texas, 198, I should say. Uh, that's in comparison to all of 2024. All of 2024, there were 285 cases documented. In the first week of March, we're up to 222. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, it's not without consequences. 17% of the individuals uh, confirmed to have measles have been hospitalized so far. And we know of two deaths uh, that have occurred in measles infected person. Mm -hmm. So do we expect this to be continuing story for the year in terms of this, this, this spread and outbreak? So far, the uh, of the individuals who came down with measles, 94% are either unvaccinated or have an unknown status so far. Mm -hmm. This basically means uh, in, in communities where the vaccination rates are not optimal, and when we say optimal for a virus as infectious as measles, we're talking 95% coverage. Mm -hmm. In such communities, I'd be very concerned about the rapid spread of measles and the resultant morbidity and mortality in, in, those, uh, in those communities. So the recommendations are vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. Is that, is that an yeah. accurate uh, statement? It is an accurate statement. And not only that, we need really high coverage and go back to taking uh, seriously. Uh, the toll of measles on, on the population. Children as young as 12 months can have their first dose uh, and then another catch-up dose uh, around the uh, kindergarten age, somewhere between four and six years of age. And that is considered to, to result in 97% of the individuals in an immunity for life. Right. Having said that, uh, when an outbreak is really uh, uh, ferocious with the, with the high number of individuals being infected, um, that can be overcome. And we do end up with cases in individuals who are vaccinated, albeit in a much milder format or much milder clinical presentation. Got it. Well, that very good information. Thank you for talking about bird flu uh, and what's happening in that space and really interesting contrast to measles and in in how infectious that is and how we really need to be focused on vaccinating our children. So thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for all you do. And vaccinating adults who have not gotten their vaccine as children. There's always time to get yourself protected. Great way to end. Thank you very much, Dr. El Salih. Well, thank you for joining me and I'll see you at the next 5-Minute Check-In.